Good morning. This is Jessica Costantino from the Massachusetts State Office of AARP. You are joining a caregiving in the community uh, part of a series that we are holding, and we are so thankful that you have joined today. I am joined by fellow colleagues and also some experts in the field. We've got our national office expert, Leslie Cyphers, who will be talking about caregiving at the, at the broadest uh, look. And then Antron Watson will speak about what livable communities at ARP and elsewhere looks like and why that matters to you. We've got a local specialist, which is terrific, Deb Del Foley, who will be talking about what's happening near you. And then finally, we'll wrap up with questions and comments. So a bit of housekeeping. On the bottom ribbon, you can see that there is something that says Q&A and also chat. If you have comments or questions and you would like to um, ask them or make them, you can put them in either and we will get to them and I will try to answer them as we go along. So um, we're going to get started and feel free to put your comments and questions as we go along, or you can save them to the end. So I'd like to turn it over now to Leslie Cyphers, who will share some information about how ARP is thinking about caregiving and why caregivers matter so much to us. Take it away, Leslie. Thanks, Jess. Hi, everyone. My name is Leslie Cyphers. Uh, I work at AARP's national office in Washington, DC. Um, I'm really happy to join you guys today. I previously worked um, in the Massachusetts State Office for about two and a half years. Um, so really happy to be back with you guys. Um, I'm hoping everybody can see my screen. Um, just to give you guys a little bit more information about AARP Family Caregiving and some of the caregiving resources that we have available. Um, AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that empowers people to choose how they live as they age. Um, and one of the ways that we do that is by providing resources and support for, for family caregivers. Um, there are over 48 million family caregivers in the United States who provide unpaid care for family members and loved ones, um, such as friends, neighbors, spouses, grandparents, and parents. Uh, AARP advocates for policy changes to support these caregivers on both a state and a federal level. AARP has done a lot of research around unpaid family caregiving, and this research has really highlighted the need for resources and supports for caring for these family members and loved ones. Um, in 2020, there was an update in a piece of research called Caregiving in the U.S., and it showed that there was an increase in the number of family caregivers uh, between 2015 and 2020 of about nine, mil nine and a half million family caregivers. Um, therefore, family caregivers now encompass more than one in five Americans. And in the state of Massachusetts, uh, as of 2017, Massachusetts had um, just under a million family caregivers at 840,000. Um, keep in mind, this number is obviously five years old now, so the amount is probably much higher. Uh, these family caregivers provided a total of 700 million hours of care to their loved ones. Um, and because of this huge, um, this huge amount of care and these, th this large amount of family caregivers in every state, AARP decided to really focus on providing resources on the state and local level um, and created state caregiver resource guides uh, in order to help family caregivers access key programs, services, and agencies in their community. Uh, so I've listed three URLs here. Uh, the first URL you can see on your screen, aarp.org slash caregiver resource guides, um, has icons for every single state in the country that you can click on to pull up the resource guides. Um, I've also listed the Massachusetts specific URL here as well. Um, another great resource is the Community Resource Finder, which is a collaboration between the AARP and the Alzheimer's Association, which has local information on programs and events, care at home, community services, housing options, and medical services. If you go to this website, communityresourcefinder.org, it will ask you for your zip code um, so that it can steer you toward whatever resources you might choose. 
AARP's main website for family caregiving resources is the Caregiving Resource Center at aarp.org caregiving. This is a site where family caregivers can access information, content, tools, and a whole host of links related to family caregiving. We do also have this website available in Spanish as well. Um, there is a toll-free specialized call center in both English and Spanish, um, these two numbers you see here, um, that serve AARP members and non-members who might have any questions related to caregiving um, and finding resources. AARP, one of our, I think, most popular resources um, and most well-known are the AARP Family Caregiving Guides, uh, previously known as the Prepare to Care Guides, which are designed to help and develop um, a caregiving plan for a loved one or friend. Uh, these guides include information on how to have really hard but important conversations um, with your loved one about the care that they currently need or they might need in the future um, and how they really want to go about um, receiving this care. The guides are available um, at aarp.org slash prepare to care. They're available in English, Spanish, and Chinese. We also have versions available for the Asian American, veteran and LGBTQ communities. AARP, as I mentioned, does a lot of research. Um, and one of the things that we've focused on is the cost of caring. Um, the nation's 48 million unpaid family caregivers are not only dedicating their time and efforts to their loved ones, um, most of them are also spending their own money on caregiving expenses. Um, the average annual caregiver expenditure, which is out of pocket, is just under $7,200 a year. 30% uh, of family caregivers say they have covered rent or mortgage payments for their loved ones. 21% have financed home modifications, and about half have used their own money for household-related expenses. I'd also like to mention that um, the COVID-19 pandemic really magnified the duties of caregivers, but also the cost of caregiving, um, with 42% of respondents uh, saying that they now spend more time and money on caregiving. Um, these AARP studies really highlight the need to provide more financial supports for families, um, which is one of the reasons that we've uh, recently worked on this uh, new resource, the Financial Workbook for Family Caregivers, uh, which is a guide to help you really get organized as a caregiver uh, each set of workbooks has sheets designed to capture essential information that you might need to manage the responsibilities of caregiving. Um, it covers the areas of health, housing, money, and future planning. We do also have a version available for veteran and military family caregivers that has real specifics for that community. And those, both of those URLs are on the bottom of the screen. Um, lastly, just would like to mention three more um, really important resources. Uh, AARP runs a family caregiving Facebook group, which is a private group moderated by AARP staff, volunteers, and consultants. Um, if you are not a member, you are able to request to join to view the content um, where you can ask questions and interact with other volunteers um, and caregivers. We also host um, a platform of instructional caregiving videos focused on training family caregivers who might perform medical or nursing tasks for their loved one. Um, they are free videos that are available online. Um, you can see a, um, an example on the left, um, a video about wound care. The whole series is available in both English and Spanish. Lastly, um, uh, resource called AARP Learn at 50 Plus, which hosts monthly live webinars. Um, these webinars are live chats with speakers who are able to answer participants' questions directly. Um, I think the best thing about this is that um, these webinars are held live, but the recordings are available online for on-demand viewing. So thank you, Jess and Antron, so much for having me join you guys today. Um, this has been great, and I hope you guys have found it helpful. Thank you, Leslie. That is really important information. And for people who are just joining, I've put in the chat that we will be sending out this recording uh, with all the information 
after the series completes today. So you don't have to take copious notes unless you want to. Um, Leslie, you've really shown us that ARP is putting its full weight behind this issue and trying to help our caregivers. And what do we know about them? I think there's a couple of really key takeaways. If you are a caregiver, it can be overwhelming. And chances are, if you're not a caregiver, you might be in the future or you might need care. And so these resources are really designed to help you wherever you are in the process of helping to care for someone or potentially needing care. Um, and when we talk about caregivers, there's a, we've had a few questions in the past about what is a caregiver? And really it's anybody who's helping someone else. We, at ARP, we really focus primarily on adults, helping our other adult people that we love or our neighbors or community members. But there is a special um, exception really because of ARP's membership around grandparents helping their grandchildren. And we know a lot of people are in that, that category. So we do have resources there as well. But we wanted to make sure that people had information about what was happening at ARP across all the states. And really, we're gonna now move to what is happening closer to home. Antron is gonna talk about um, some of what we call livable communities. That's how to make sure our communities are really designed to help us age well and stay in them because we know that's where people wanna stay. So I'm turning it over to you, Antron. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jess. Uh, yeah, as Jess said, you know, it really comes down to when we think about caregiving as a bigger, broader picture, it is about the community. Uh, so I actually have a video from our uh, director of uh, livable communities, Michael Watson, who's really going to talk about a lot of what ARP does um, and working in collaboration with communities, with community leaders, um, key stakeholders to make our communities great places for people of all ages. Santron, it's great to be here and uh, uh, great to hear Leslie share a little bit about the work that ARP is doing to support family caregivers. As Antron said, one of the reasons that ARP works on livable communities and kind of one of the things that really kind of drives our work is because we believe um, and we know that older adults want to remain in their communities as they age. Roughly eight and 10 people from across the country tell us every single year when we ask this survey question, that they want to remain in their home as they age and they want to remain in their community as they age. We also know that this country is getting older and it's getting older in perpetuity. Um, and community leaders and local governments need to be prepared for that. And we've seen that local governments that have seen their aging population years ago and took action to be prepared for it are gonna be better positioned for that because what they're doing is they're looking at their community through the lens of an older adult and are identifying the supports, resources, and infrastructure that's necessary for an older adult to thrive in their community. And they realize that when you do that, you're going to create a community, as Antron said, that's great for everybody. If you design a community around the needs of an older adult, it's going to be great for their children, for their grandchildren, for their neighbors, and for their friends. And that's really what drives AARP's work on livable communities. We know our country is getting older. We know our members and people over the age of 50 want to remain in their communities as they age. And we know that that has benefits for everyone when local leaders and communities take action to, to make that a reality. The way that we typically do this, and you're going to hear a little bit more about this later, is through the ARP network of age-friendly states and communities. There are about 700 communities across the country, including a large number, again, you'll see this a bit later, in the state of Massachusetts in this region. And Massachusetts as a state is also a member of this network. So you are kind of in a place that has um, a lot of communities that are committed. There's a lot of great partners and there's a lot of great folks who are working to ensure that the places you live are great for older adults uh, today and in the future. And one of the things that we see is throughout the uh, uh, global coronavirus pandemic, um, we've seen that the communities that took action to become, uh, to try to work to become great places for all, listening to the needs of older adults, developing action plans and implementing those action plans based on those needs, were better positioned to respond. They knew the resources were in place. They had the partnerships in place. 
and folks were able to kind of uh, reach older adults more quickly, provide critical and life-saving information in a lot of circumstances. And we know that family caregiving and the needs of family caregivers is a core driver of communities who are taking action to make places more livable for all ages. I'm gonna highlight a few different ways that we're seeing communities nationwide do this. Um, and then we're gonna talk, I'll talk a little bit about some resources that ARP has to help you prepare your home and your community. The first way that we see communities taking action to become great places for all and supporting family caregivers is by providing information, providing resources, and providing access to healthcare uh, connections uh, as well. Three things, one, uh, a few things I'll highlight. First, uh, an example is it right here in Massachusetts, in Salem, Massachusetts. During the uh, coronavirus pandemic, they applied 206 volunteers to contract 6,000 people over the age of 50 to ensure that they were safe, had their needs met, including food, nutrition, and telehealth services as well. So they were able to kind of quickly get to people who needed support and train family caregivers as well. Also in Ridgewood, New Jersey, they developed a network of retired medical professionals who would go around and assist older adults and new family caregivers who required training and assistance. So these community-driven folks dedicating their time are training people in what it takes to become and be a family caregiver, um, a, a skill uh, that uh, kind of a task that, that many of us are, are uh, doing often without training. The other way that we see communities supporting family caregivers is by increasing access to transportation options. Again, we saw this during the coronavirus pandemic in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and many other places as transportation providers were adapted to deliver PPE and other life-saving materials. And here in Chelmsford in Massachusetts, we've also seen the community take action to create volunteer driving programs to help get folks from medical appointments and point A to point B and ensure that they have a friendly face to pick them up and a friendly face to get them home um, and support family caregivers in that way as well. And then finally, this is uh, one of the core ways that we see communities uh, really work to support family caregivers and support older adults so that they can thrive in place is by increasing housing options and improving the accessibility of housing. Uh, we've seen this across the country, including here in, Massa in Massachusetts and in other places across the country. Jackson, Wyoming is a great example where they created a co-housing, co-living uh, kind of program and arrangement so that older adults can be paired up with younger folks in the community to help forge those uh, connections across generations and ensure that there was an affordable living arrangement for both generations. And in Madison, New Jersey, they created a program that was going to help older adults and family caregivers finance accessibility upgrades and projects for their homes to ensure that the home that they lived in could be a home that they could live in in the future as well. We also see, and we'll hear a little bit more about this later, communities uh, looking at their policies and really trying to bring in new types of housing options known as accessory dwelling units or small kind of uh, small homes on an existing property that can allow somebody else to live on the property um, and provide some care for somebody. And we know that about 70% of people over the age of 50 have said that they would consider building or living in an accessory dwelling unit to allow somebody to have, uh, to kind of uh, increase their access to care from a family member. So those are several ways that we're seeing it. I wanna highlight a, a few resources that you can use to help you age in place and support your loved ones as they're aging. The first is AARP's Home Fit Guide. This is a resource that's available at aarp.org backslash home fit. And it's gonna give you step-by-step -step checklists for repairs and upgrades you can make to your home to make it more livable for all ages. You can also go to aarp.org backslash livable to find loads of resources on the topics of public spaces, transportation, housing, creating parks that are more uh, kind of intergenerational, creating more transportation options that are gonna be great for older adults and younger adults and more. And then finally, also encourage you to go to um, AARP's Livability Index at aarp.org backslash livability index. There you can look up your community's livability score, identify areas that are important to you, and take action by talking to your, uh, your local community leaders, talking to AARP Massachusetts and other folks about um, uh, challenges you're seeing and challenges that you want to see addressed. So with that, again, want to thank you for um, being here today. Thank you for 
um, for listening to us. Thank you for having me share a little bit about ARP's work on local communities and really, um, really looking forward to hearing from more folks. So I really want to thank, you know, Mike Watson for really giving that message and really bringing home what, what ARP is really doing to, to help older adults stay in community and really support our caregivers um, by working with municipal leaders. Um, as you mentioned there, uh, accessory dwelling units is a is a one of the, the features that we've seen in policies changing that are really allowing for, for folks to stay in community um, and for for caregivers to bring caregivers um, closer to them um, in some cases. Um, but next, we're gonna drill down a little bit more into what's happening here in Massachusetts. Um, I'm gonna bring on uh, my colleague, uh, James Fuccioni from the Massachusetts Healthy Aging Collaborative, um, who does a lot of work here. He's kind of my roadshow partner when we talk about aging dementia friendly here in the state. Uh, so I'm tossing to you, James. Hey, thanks so much, Antron. Good morning, everybody. So James Fuccioni from the Massachusetts Healthy Aging Collaborative, as Antron mentioned, I'm just going to share uh, some slides so I can show you what this movement is all about in Massachusetts. All right, great. So just a little bit of background. Uh, the Healthy Aging Collaborative is supported primarily by the Point 32 Health Foundation. That's the combination of Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare and Tufts Health Plan. And our goal, as Antron was talking about and Mike Watson was talking about, is to support inclusive age and dementia-friendly communities across the state. Um, there's a statewide initiative where the, uh, the governor, Governor Charlie Baker, committed to this movement, and more than 90 communities across the state have committed to this movement as well. So very likely, uh, you live in a community that's working to become more age uh, and dementia-friendly, uh, and if not, your input is critical to moving that, um, that those initiatives forward. So just going to jump in and talk about um, sort of the definition of age friendly, according to the World Health Organization that started this movement way back. Um, and ARP has since strengthened and um, really moved the, uh, the move the initiative forward. So an, an ideal age friendly environment uh, are inclusive, equitable, inclusive accessible, equitable, inclusive, safe and secure and supportive, got that all out, uh, and recognizing that older people play a crucial role in their communities, both as caregivers themselves, but also um, as kind of care recipients uh, at times. And so a community um, in both social and physical environment can be more supportive uh, of caregivers and of older adults. Uh, there is a, an entire framework for this movement uh, where communities give uh, feedback and there's outreach and engagement, surveys, listening sessions to make these age and dementia friendly community plans uh, customized to the local experience. So this is sort of all the menu of options that any community can uh, sort of choose from in terms of resources and funding opportunities uh, and, and all kinds of just examples from the more than 700 age-friendly communities from across the country. Antron and Mike were talking about housing issues, but also transportation, technology, uh, public spaces and buildings, social inclusion, uh, and of course, access, equity and inclusion uh, for diverse older adults. Uh, this is all part of the mix and depends on uh, the feedback that you hear from any community that drives a local age and dementia-friendly action plan. Um, so we've gotten questions before and uh, I'm working to improve this map, but essentially the red hearts on this map uh, represent the more than 90 age-friendly, recognized by AARP, age-friendly communities across the state. All of the green hearts are the communities that are working to become more age-friendly, uh, not uh, on this map, just to keep it from being a little less overwhelming, <laughs> a little more overwhelming, is uh, there are more than 100 dementia-friendly communities as well. Uh, we combine and align the age and dementia friendly uh, frameworks so that any community uh, can pursue both. And we encourage communities to pursue, pursue both age and dementia friendly uh, initiatives. And there's lots of regional work going on as well. We're getting uh, communities to work together on this in sort of clusters around the state, including Martha's Vineyard, um, Cape Ann, uh, the Berkshires and uh, Franklin County and North Quabbin Town. So, um, so again, with all of those sort of captured, uh, there are more than 150 communities uh, 
that are part of the regional initiatives. Just, to, just so you can get a sense of who's involved in these movements uh, across the state on the left-hand side of this slide, you can see Salem for All Ages, uh, if that's what they call their age-friendly initiative that's led by uh, Mayor Kim Driscoll's office, but uh, has a leadership council of all kinds of folks from across different parts of the community, different city departments, but also you know, the police department, of course, the Council on Aging, but the PBD Essex Museum, Salem State University, and the local chamber of commerce to think about how all of those parts of the community can sort of look through that age-friendly lens that Mike and Antron were talking about uh, and be more supportive of people of all ages in the community. On the right-hand side of the slide are uh, sort of a, a combo platter of different leadership uh, leader organizations that lead this uh, this work on a local or regional level, including again, a chamber of commerce, public health departments, regional planning agencies, um, and just uh, councils on aging and uh, aging service access points. So lots of different ways uh, that this that this movement can show up in communities. And then sort of a, a sort of a, a just a, a lot of sort of visualization of what this turns into in communities. Um, it, it can be anything from community design, as you see in the top middle, where this is um, um, just an age friendly street design where uh, city planners actually engage older adults in what would you want to see this, this kind of road and street design look like. So all the input was taken into account in terms of crosswalks, bike lanes, having benches around, um, and really thinking about uh, how physical infrastructure supports healthy aging. Uh, you can see intergenerational gardening, uh, co-locating schools and councils on aging to help um, really bring together young and old for intergenerational programs in the bottom left. Uh, there's a story in the globe about fare free buses in the city of Lawrence that came from uh, their age friendly initiative um, and so on and so forth, lots of different funding opportunities and toolkits and guides uh, that really move, you know, this initiative forward on a local level. So lots of different things to uh, that, you know, lots of positive impact that can come out of all of this. Uh, of course, we have a website and with even more resources, if uh, AARP's uh, library of goods wasn't enough, we have lots of data on every city and town. We have um, all kinds of reports and funding opportunities and resources uh, for caregiving, for all kinds of different things. So I invite you to just check us out um, and reach out to me if you're interested in getting involved on a local level. But with that, I'll turn it back over to Antron, and I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much, James. Really highlighting what, what's happening here in Massachusetts to assist old adults and, and how communities are really working together uh, to bring us all to, to bring us together and keep us in community, um, especially when, when we talk about the, the different um, groups leading the efforts. Uh, that's one of the things that we it's important uh, because it's not always the, the state that's that's kind of doing these things. It's not just ARP that's doing this. There are partners on the ground who are really engaged in making making our communities great for everybody. Uh, so that actually leads me to our next guest, um, who is Deb Dowd Foley from the uh, Elder Services of Worcester area, um, who's going to talk about some local resources specific to caregivers. Uh, so turn it over to you, Deb. Thank you, Antron. So I, I work with the Family Caregiver Support Program here at Elder Services of Worcester area, and we are part of a network of 25 agencies throughout the state um, under the Executive Office of Elder Affairs, who really focus on providing services to frail elders to keep them in their home as safe as possible. Uh, we, we also do other programs as well, but since I work with the Family Caregiver Support Program, that's my ex kind of expertise and um, we'll focus more on that. Um, we do cover Worcester in the 14 surrounding towns. So um, one of the things that I try to do with caregivers is to get them to learn about what are the um, the resources in their in their world, whether it's their small world of family, friends, or neighbors, really getting them to um, have a conversation about what is it that they want or what is it they need. So many of us want to just stay independent as long as possible, but as we age with chronic illnesses, 
it can become more and more challenging. So reaching out to your informal network is a really the first place that I would recommend um, and, and not wait for the crisis to happen. And then everybody's scrambling to try to figure out what should we do? I don't know what mom or dad wanted or whatever that might be. So, um, you know, we look, try to get caregivers to look at the legal, the medical, the financial and social, all of these pieces of our lives that we take for granted until they become a challenge. So the other thing is to um, just have maybe a family meeting. And maybe that family is a friend, a good friend. I get calls from friends who are concerned about um, another friend and, and looking for resources. The other is to try and discover tips um, for yourself while caring for a loved one. Um, we know that caregivers tend to neglect their own needs. And so my job is really focusing on the caregiver to say, you're is just as important, your care, as the person that you're caring for. And also, you know, I'll throw out the question, what if something happens to you? Um, so self-care can go a long way in keeping your stress level down, keeping your relationship in a positive mode, and really um, helping you to be the best caregiver that you can. And so a lot of times it's just having a conversation about respite. What does that mean? It's taking a break, whether it's 15 minutes every day, you're going to take a walk, you just wanna read a book. Taking time out for you is a really nice way to either start your day or, or find it somewhere in all the tasks that so many caregivers often have that they'll tell me, you know, I don't have time to go to the doctors. I'm too busy caring for someone else. But that's not a, a healthy way of being um, the best caregiver. And so maybe you have to arrange for respite um, more than the 15 minutes. You need a break to go away for a day, to go out for a few hours every week. So maybe it's, again, back to the conversation with your family, friends, or neighbors. Hey, can you sit with you know, my husband or my father while I get out and do, you know, something enjoyable, um, not just another task, although that also can help as well, but also just having, um, you know, that person to fall back on. So many family members would step it up if they knew what their loved ones needed. So communication is really key, I would say. And, and also if that isn't available, um, hiring somebody, you know, looking to your, you know, different resources with, um, is a good way to, to reach out. And so where do you find those local resources? You can start with us um, because we have a really strong information and referral department. We keep a list, um, several uh, lists of all different topics related to trans transportation was mentioned, private home care agencies, elder law attorneys, adult day health, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when under the family caregiver support program that I work for, it's federally funded, it's throughout the country. And um, in here in the Worcester area, which we cover Worcester and the 14 surrounding towns, I try to get out to do educational uh, trainings and um, in different senior centers throughout. Um, but we also have options counselors who can meet with the, either the individual or the caregiver or family members who have concerns or just don't know where to start. Uh, so they can meet with them over the phone or in person. Um, online resources have become an incredible way for caregivers to connect with other caregivers so that if getting out is not an option for you or you know, you're limited um, in getting out, but you still are looking for more resources. Uh, um, the technology has exploded. So we, since COVID, have been trying to ramp that up as well with um, a list of technology devices to help the caregiver, especially when taking care of somebody who has dementia or even someone who's frail and is a fall risk or whatever. Um, so we do have that list available as well. Um, I always encourage caregiver uh, blogs and forums are a way Facebook has groups where you can connect with other caregivers. We don't recommend you take any legal or medical advice, but just knowing that there's other people out there like yourself 
um, who might have a challenging situation that you can relate to, offer advice or take, you know, like, oh, that's an idea I hadn't thought of, you know, doing with my loved one. Um, caregiver support groups. Again, those um, took a kind of a, a twist during COVID. Uh, many stopped, some went virtual, and now post COVID, we're seeing a mix of caregiver online support groups and some in person ones. These are free. It's a place for caregivers to connect, connect with others, and again, just um, supporting each other. Um, one other thing I'd like to mention is, you know, the, the senior centers also have are a great resource for your town around what are the what are some fun things they do, educational, uh, transportation, there's meal sites, uh, these, these are social events that you and your loved one possibly could attend, um, depending on, you know, their health needs and um, what you're, you know, looking for but we try to connect with them. And one of the things I'm doing and have been for a few years with the Worcester Senior Center is we run a free memory cafe. They're throughout the country, um, but you can find them in beyond Worcester, but we do uh, run one. And it's where the caregiver and their loved one with a dementia can come and enjoy socializing, so we have refreshments, um, entertainment, or an activity, and it, it's just a great place for people to connect and, and be with each other, because we know that social um, engagement is also really important to self-care and staying healthy. So I think I've covered it all in a few minutes and hopefully um, got people to at least make a phone call to Elder Services or their senior center and start with us to um, answer some of those questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deb, for really bringing it, bringing it home, you know, bringing it local um, and, and reminding people that their senior centers are, are a great resource to really connect with and organizations like yours uh, to help, you know, ask those questions on, on where to start. Um, if you, you know, you're identifying as a caregiver, where do I start? What are the questions? I, what are the things I can do prior to the, um, the, the emergency? All right, so thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, so now we're at the agenda, we're at the point of the agenda where we wanna hear from you. Are there questions that you, that you have? Um, please, bottom of the screen, there is a, a Q and A on the bottom ribbon, um, or you can put them in chat. Um, either way, we will get your questions answered. Um, yeah, we'll go from there. So Antron, I don't see anybody with a comment or question yet, but while people are formulating those and getting ready to, share them. Um, I just want to say to folks that we know that it that being a caregiver can be overwhelming. And even when you think about the amount of resources that were just shared today, um, what we're hoping is that caregivers have a sort of no wrong door, right? So whether you are coming in at the local community level because of your Council on Aging, or if you are contacting your elder services, um, which in Massachusetts is often called the ASAP. We love our acronyms, which stands for Aging Service Access Points. Or if you're contacting ARP or the Mass Healthy Aging Collaborative, you know, we really want to make sure that people are directed to resources where they, where they find them. And so hopefully this has shown some of the places and how you can get those resources. But I think we have one more slide about um, in general in Massachusetts, we've got a, we've got a resource called Mass Options. Ah, there it is. It's um, Mass Options. It's a 1-800 number um, and you can talk to an individual and it provides uh, caregivers with one-on-one -on -one counselors. So if you don't know, I live in Community X and I'm not sure what kind of support groups might be there and what might be helpful for me. Mass Options is a great place to start. As you can see on the left-hand side, uh, you know, with more than 840,000 family caregivers, and again, Leslie pointed out that number is from five years ago. So we are expecting that that number has gone up, but um, let's just start with even that number, hundreds of thousands of people who are helping someone else to stay as uh, healthy and in their community as possible. We need to make sure that these resources are, 
are available to them. I see a comment in the chat now. Can someone from the Middlesex area go to the Worcester Memory Cafe? Um, I don't know that you can go to the, if you can or you cannot, I'm gonna ask Deb to approach that. But one of the things that we know is that there is a way to find out if there is a memory cafe closer to you. So while you might be interested in, um, in a memory cafe that is, is closer to you, maybe Worcester, <laughs> you've got some, some real interest in Worcester in particular, but I'm gonna ask Deb, do you know if we're limited by community for each of the memory cafes? Uh, our cafes, and as far as I know throughout the state are open to anyone and someone just posted the Jewish Family and Children's Services website. So thank you for that. They keep a, an up-to-date list of all the cafes in the state of Massachusetts. Some are virtual, many are back to in-person. And I would encourage people, as I do to the people who come to Worcester, to go to any, there's, you know, Shrewsbury Library um, has twice a month and the Senior Center has twice a month. So you can go to as many as you would like. And we find people coming from outside of our area um, to our cafe as well. Good to know. Maybe Worcester's the place to be. You've got the Woo Sox there now. Maybe everybody wants to take a spin over to Worcester, no matter where you're coming from. Absolutely. So, great. Well, thanks, Deb. Um, any other comments or questions from people? As we said, we're going to post this recording after the series completes today. And we will, uh, so you will have all of this information. We have a lot of resources in Massachusetts. We hope that you found this helpful. I'm going to turn it back over to Antron to close us up unless there's a specific comment or question from many more of the participants. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, as, as you said, thank you to, to everyone for attending today, um, for, for really being here to, to get uh, all of this information tossed at you. Um, as Jess mentioned, we will be sharing this um, as a follow-up email. Uh, so please um, look for that information uh, shortly. Um, another uh, set of resources that were mentioned throughout the day uh, were the ARP Prepare to Care uh, resources, um, the accessory dwelling units uh, booklet, as well as a home fit guide uh, that really helps you walk through your home and, and look at modifications that you can do in your own home uh, so that you can stay safe. Um, with that, Antron, before we end, if I might interrupt, one of the things that we have on the right side of the slide is this where it says sign up as an e-activist. And people may wonder, what the heck is that? Well, that's a way to get involved. Um, we've talked a lot about resources and what's available for caregivers and different ways to help in the community. But another thing that ARP does, which we haven't talked at all about, is our advocacy efforts. And we are trying to make policies um, with state and federal officials that really help people as they age. One of them specifically on caregiving in Massachusetts, for example, is to try to get past a family caregiver tax credit. And what does that mean? It would be actually getting a tax credit for you as a taxpayer in Massachusetts of up to $1,500 refundable on your tax forms. Um, and so we've been working on that at the state legislature, but we always need more people to help. So if you're interested in helping with that and or getting updates on that or other advocacy related things, you can go to ARP.org slash get involved. And so uh, that's a space to, to get involved as well. And then if you are interested in helping us share some of this information, we have uh, what we call DIY presentations and we have people who are volunteers and help speak about that because there's nine of us in the Massachusetts State Office and We've got hundreds of thousands of ARP members, and we certainly couldn't uh, do all the work without our wonderful volunteers. So if you are interested, you can email us or send us a, a note at, um, at the Speakers Bureau MA Speaker, which is the um, place to get us if you want to be part of that team. So thank you, Antron. No worries. Um, and with that, Thank you all again for attending. Thank you to all of our presenters, James, Deb, Leslie, and Jess and Mike. Um, we hope you all have a wonderful day and uh, we'll be in contact.